So, so this morning I talked about um, this morning I talked about the four the four the four the first four of those five principles of soil health. Um, obviously, livestock play a huge role. You know, livestock play a role, um, and and they have for a long time. So. The best, the best soils in the world, okay? Now, I realize you guys are, we're, we're a forest area here. So what, so what were the best soils in the world? What, where they all, what were they? What were they develop under? Prairies, right? They sure did. They developed under prairies, right? And so it was that interaction of the herbivores, of the, of the predators that manipulated them, that, that influenced their behavior, um, that kept them herded up. That, that animal impact that they did, whether that, was, whether that was the trampling, whether it was the grazing and the moving on, it was, it was that management, that's what we're trying to emulate with our, with our grazing systems, isn't it? It's that graze and rest, graze and rest. And, <clears throat> and, and for a long time, you know, with our, with our, our and I'm gonna term it mid grazing, our, our little quicker rotation, we really only focused on the plant, didn't we? Did we leave enough leaf area to, to start capturing sunlight to, to regrow? You know, did we really talk about the soil? Did we talk about the impacts that we had to the soil? Did we talk about how much we trampled down to feed that, to feed that biology in the soil? All we ever really thought about was the, was the, the above ground plants and specifically then the, the animals. So, so this is, this is, a, this is from, from up in uh, South Dakota. Phil, Phil Jurdy up in Riva, and, and bison, you know, they're, they're in a fairly big pasture. He rotates, you know, every three or four days. But the thing about that herd right there, they're still fairly compact, aren't they? Because they have a little more of that herding instinct retained in them than, than our domesticated livestock that we have today. So, so he can get away with a, a, a little bit of different impact. Now, you know, what, what we're trying to do is we're trying to talk about the soil today. So, so, so that grazing initiates those exudates off the plant that we talked about this morning. Those, those plant exudates, the plant realizes, hey, I got grazed a little bit. I need to do what? I need to stimulate the soil to, for those organisms in the soil to bring in more nutrients, more moisture, all of the things that they do. So, so that's where using a, a very intensive system like this, um, using a high stock density that, that emulates the, the bison. Now again, that's not a very high density there, is it? So now that's where the predator impact came in. And, and you guys have probably heard that before, so we're not gonna go down that road very much. But, but the impact that those animals on a small area had on the soil, not on the plants, for, forget animal performance, forget Forget you know the plant performance. Let's just look. Think about it from a soil standpoint. Okay, so cows actually add biology. There's biology in the in the manure, in the saliva, in the milk foam, all of that. That's one reason why adding livestock into a cropping situation really has huge benefits because they bring that in. So we're going to just run through. I don't have very long today, so we're just going to run through three tools. Um, to, to that I think can can be used to improve soil health. Okay, um, that middle one you guys already you guys already got a little dose of that this morning. So we're going to give you a second dose of that. Um, then the annuals and then the first one. You know, I was up here probably four or five years ago now. I don't know if there was any of you here when I talked before, but talking about using higher stock densities. Um, you know, high, high density grazing or or and and you know what that is. I don't know. Um, it depends on, on you, but, but using those animals as a tool, you know, for me, they're my cheapest tool. It's much cheaper to fire my cows up and have them do something for me than it is to fire up a piece of equipment and put fuel through it and, and buy the steel to do it. I don't care whether you're talking about dragging a drill around or, or bush hogging something, you know, or haying something. The cows are, are by far always the cheapest tool. Um, it does take, when you're talking about daily moves, when you're talking about multiple moves per day, you're talking about some, a, a pretty high level of management, you know. Um, we, were, we were talking at lunch, you know, 
Um, the, 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 biggest, the, the biggest excuse that I always get when I talk about moving cows, for, get from people, when I talk about moving cows once a day or twice a day, you know, they say, oh, I don't have time to do that. I got to go bale hay. Okay. You, you know what? If, if you would do this instead of baling that hay, <clears throat> you'd, you'd be way better off. I got a friend down in South Missouri, not, not, not the guy I mentioned a while ago, but another guy. So we used to have him come and talk at grazing schools or we'd go out to his place. And, and he'd talk about moving cows, stalkers at that time, two or three, four times a day. And people would say, well, you know, how do you find the time? And he said, well, that, that's my job, you know. I get up in the morning, I have a cup of coffee, I go out, I move my cows, I come back, I read the paper, I go back out later on, I move the cows again. <clears throat> I come back, I eat lunch, I take a nap, I go back out in the afternoon, I move the cows again, come back in, cool off, and I go back out in the evening and move the cows again. <clears throat> that was his job, okay? He didn't, he didn't bale hay, he didn't, he didn't bush hog, he didn't do all the other things. That was his job, was to move cows. Um, you know, <clears throat> so, so it's going to take some time. It's going to take some management. You're gonna, have to, you're gonna have to figure out what's a priority. Is it gonna be baling hay? And I, again, I'm not saying you don't need some hay. I think there's some things we're gonna get to in a minute though that'll, that'll, that'll hopefully work on that a little bit. You know, we have to optimize that utilization of the forage every grazing event. Every single time those cows are in there, you gotta make the best use of that. If you're leaving something on the table, and I'm not saying we gotta graze it to the dirt every time, okay? It's not what I'm talking about, but, <clears throat> but, if we're not impacting all the plants like I showed this morning, if we're leaving some part of that, of that forage sward untouched, um, we're, we're leaving something on the table. Now, if you've got a plan to come back around and graze that in the winter, that's a different story. But, but, but do you have a plan? That's the biggest thing, is most people don't have a, don't have a grazing plan that outlines everything they want to do for the whole season. And even in the non-growing season, it takes. It's easy to. <clears throat> it's easy to have a plan during the growing season. But that plan for the for the dormant season, that's the hard one because that has to start when the growing season starts, doesn't it? Because if you're gonna <clears throat> if you're gonna have stored forage, standing stored forage all winter long, and and that's our growing season is about six months and our dormant season is about six months. <clears throat> You've got to have something standing to graze. Okay, so it does take some management, takes some planning. You know, <clears throat> that's where we talked about this morning, extending the recovery period. There's no doubt in my mind that that ex that extending that rest period and 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 using that higher stock density improves plant diversity. You know, because it, uh, particularly in my environment where we've got fescue, you know, there's there's always plants that are that are more desirable and less desirable, aren't they? I don't care where you're at. There's, there's more desirable and less desirable plants. We've created cows, by having lax grazing management, we've created cows that are highly selective. We have. And so if, if, you're, gonna, if you're gonna begin to utilize all the plants out there, you're gonna have to either, either train those cows to eat them, you know, AKA Kathy Voth and, and that training method, or you're going to have to do it with stock density, um, and and they will learn, you know, to do that. We get cows in, contract cows in from from other another producer for the summer. Um, you know, if they aren't used to that high stock density, it's going to take us, you know, a week probably to get them used to that higher stock density. To get them used to, hey, whatever's out there, I got to eat. But, but it's but it's not hard to do, you know. The, the first day, they, they might be a little picky, you know? They might go a little hungry too, huh? By the second or third day, how picky do you think they're gonna be? A whole lot less picky, right? And so, you know, you give me a week, and I can teach them to, to, to realize, hey, I've gotta eat a little bit of everything. And so, so by doing that, we reduce their selectivity. That, in turn, then, gives the gives all the plants the same starting point every time we move on and leave a field. We don't have plants that are that are grazed, you know, lower than other plants. That's that's the plan anyway. Um, and and I, I just don't think you can do that. That you can truly do that 
um, and, and prevent overgrazing as well, unless you're on at least daily moves. Mineral cycle, um, having all those deep tap-rooted plants, you know, generally broadleaf plants are deeper tap-rooted than, than uh, grass plants. Grass plants generally tend to be shallower, more fibrous-rooted plants. Um, if we want that mineral cycle to be functioning, if we want to go deep and pull those minerals back up, we've got to have deep tap-rooted plants. And I think the only way we're going to do that is to, is, is to have a very intensive management. You know, as we, store, as we store more organic matter in the soil from those deep tap-rooted plants, we're going to capture more rainfall. Um, I, just, I just think, fr from my standpoint, that, that that tool of stock density, using animal impact and stock density, that's, that's my best tool to, to do all of these things. I can improve the mineral cycle, the water cycle, and both of those in turn plant plant volume, which then in turn or builds organic matter. So it's just a continual snowball effect. Um, but it has to start with you. It's got to start with you, and you got to make the decision, hey, I'm going to put some time and effort into this plan. I'm going to figure out where I'm going to be with those cows at certain times of the year. I'm going to figure out what kind of, and then you got to do some monitoring. You got to pay attention. What kind of stock density do if I use if I use fifty thousand pounds of stock density for a couple of weeks, you know, and then come back and evaluate the impact you had on the land at that at that level. Then come back, you know, maybe you've got a few days when you can move them five or six times a day. Then come back and monitor that later and see. You know, it's not something people always get hung up. Man, I don't want to move cows that many times a day all the time. You don't. You know, you can use it as a treatment. You can say, okay, that field right there, I need to do something to it. I need to, I need to take the weeds out. I need to, to, to knock down the brush a little. You can use them as a treatment. Um, now, I'm here to tell you, if you've got, if you've got cows that aren't, that aren't very tough, okay, you're going you're gonna to you're gonna have to, if you're hard on them to do a treatment like that, then you're going to have to come back and, and, and be easy on them and let them refuel and fill back up. Um, doing something else with them. <clears throat> this is just an example. This is one of our places here. Um, like this is a this is a 240 right here in the middle. Um, so typically, all the all the yellow is either going to be uh, the perimeter is going to be uh, permanent fence. All the interior yellow is going to be single wire high tensile. Um, the blue then is going to be poly wire. So we'll start out at a, at the at the water source and work our way away from the water source. I will, I'll typically want to be out of this area in, you know, three to five days. I, I, want, to, I want to be, I'll let them back graze, but I'll just keep working away from the water. Um, and, and so just depending on how, how intensive we are, that depends on, on what we're trying to do at that particular time. We'll just keep, we'll just keep leapfrogging those fences away from the water. Um, you know, it doesn't take any time at all to go out and, and move a, That'd be like a half a quarter right there. So you're talking six or seven hundred feet of fence. You know, you can go out and move a, pull, pull one up and put one in, you know, in just 10 minutes. And, and the cows move themselves. You're, you're, you're looking at them. You're evaluating them. You're seeing if there's any sick ones. You're checking out calves. We calve right in that system just like that. Okay. Eliminating hay. Eliminating hay. I'm going to see what time it is. I don't want to go talking too long today. I'm going to sit this right there. Okay. Eliminating hay. We talked about this a little bit this morning. And there's going to be lots of, lots of ways to do that besides, besides just trying to graze all winter. You know, um, maybe I was, I was over in New York a year ago, you know, and they, they got the area where I was at in upstate New York. They, they ended up with... I don't know, four or five feet of snow sometimes, they said. Um, you know, so what's their solution going to be for the winter? Maybe it's not to have hay. Maybe it's not to have cows in the winter. Maybe, maybe it's going to be more efficient from an energy standpoint. Maybe it's going to be maybe more economically viable to bring stalkers in for the summer and only run them in the summer. What does Neil Dennis do? Run stalkers in the summer. Okay. So, so I think, 
you know, we've got to, we've got to put a lot of thought and, and, and be open-minded. That's the hardest thing to do, being open-minded to, to, some, of these, to some of these things, is, is trying to figure out, you know, maybe I've got to totally do something different. I've got to get out of the cow-calf business. I've got, to, I've got to totally do something different, okay? So, you know, again, wh why do people rely so much on, hey, this morning I said, well, it's because that's the way we've always done it, right? Um, Somebody, some people just need, need, need something to do, right? I mean, you know, here you got a situation, you got, you got lots of grass, you know, maybe there was a reason for feeding this hay there. There was, but well, that's another discussion. When you have a, when you have a 70, 73 year old father now, you know, it, it, he does pretty good most of the time when I'm gone. But, but sometimes, uh, you know, <clears throat> I went to, I, I went to, this, this summer I had the chance to go to, to go to Africa for a couple weeks, and, and while I was gone, I came back, and I, and I looked on a hillside, and I was like, what the heck, that looks like hay bales over there on that hill. You know, it, it, it falling back into old habits is really easy to do. We hadn't, we hadn't bailed any of our own hay, and he didn't bail it, he had somebody come in, but, but he was like, oh, there's a lot of extra grass there. Well, you know, there was a reason there was extra grass there. But, 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 but old habits, you know, somebody asked him, hey, you want us to bail that? Oh, sure, that'd be great, you know? And so, you know, we just set, we just set that back. So old habits die hard. Change is hard. It, 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 that, the hardest thing you're going to do is not going to be figuring out. It's going to be, it's going to be getting those old habits out of your out of your head. That's going to be the hardest thing you're going to do. Um, you know, here, here's somebody feeding hay in the middle of summer. You know, so, so what are the other reasons that, that people rely so much on feeding hay? Well, you know, they might not have the right stocking rate. You know, we see that a lot. We see, we see particularly, particularly operations that have, maybe they have multiple farms, so they say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to graze this one all summer, and then I'm going to you know, bale hay on this one. Well, if their stocking rate is right for the whole operation, guess what? They got them on this place all summer long. They're probably overstocked on this operation. So, so you lead, it leads you to situations like this. You know, I just took this picture driving down the road. You know, here we are in August, you know, and, and the pastures are fairly short. You know, feeding hay in the middle of the summer. You know, there's just, there's just, there's a lot of reasons. Hay, hay has become so easy to do, hadn't it? Man, you got big equipment, you got tractors that are air conditioned, you got mowers that'll mow anything, you know, it's easy. You know, I, I, I would contend that, that, that Mr. Vermeer, the gentleman that invented the big baler, made, made really, really bad grass managers out of a lot of people, out of a lot of people, because it's easy. Because it's easy. You know, if the stocking rate is right, there should be enough, enough grass to at least graze March through December, right? If you've got to feed hay in the winter, that's fine. But, but this feeding hay in the middle of the summer, that's, that's, just, that's, that's just crazy if you ask me. So, you know, hay, hay might be needed in the winter a little bit. So here's a couple of great pictures. This one, I, I do a lot. If you're following me going down the road, you're probably going to stop a lot and take pictures. So I saw this place, um, and, and, and no offense, but it actually, it, it, it actually is a veterinarian's place. <laughs> so, so check out the date, okay? He's feeding some hay. He's got, best I could tell, there was about 50 or 60 cows in this group of cows. Um, this is right up close to the barn. But it is on the edge of the pasture. There's no fence. The, the pasture goes, I don't know how big. So check out the date. Okay, we're talking November. We're talking November. So we fed this set of cows here all winter. And that's the spring. Okay. That's the spring. What allowed him to do that? Man, them front wheel assist tractors are really cool, aren't they? Huh? Pull it in there. While we're in the mud, dump it in back out it's easy we need to, we need to 
We need to quit taking the easy way out, don't we? You know, here's, here's when, when we get situations when we want to feed some hay in the snow, and that's the only time we're going to feed it, you know. I mean, you know, we may, we may mess up on some management. I, I'll be honest, I got a set of cows right now. I had, I had, because I had a corral out, tore out to rebuild and didn't get it rebuilt. And then we had to AI some stuff. We grazed to one place and, and I just, I messed up. My, my plan didn't account for that corral being, being out as long as it is. It's still not rebuilt. And if anybody wants to come help, okay, about the 1st of April, give me a call, show up. So, so we will, we'll, we'll feed on frozen ground, snow ground. We'll systematically unroll it. Um, generally, I try to feed that hay at the farthest part away from the water because the cows are naturally over time going to drag that, those nutrients back toward the water source, aren't they? This is, this is the farthest corner away from the water. This is a 10 acre piece, 10 acre piece right here. Okay, So, so we're going to systematically feed that. Do we always unroll it? No, sometimes we'll feed it in rings, but, a, but, a hay, but, but more than one hay bale never gets fed in the same spot. Feed a bale, feed another bale. We do a little bit of the bale grazing that, that they mentioned earlier. Um, but again, you know, because those nutrients, that's, that's for the most part my fertility program, remember? I'm buying that for less than the value of N, P, and K in it. So that's, that's my fertility program. So this is an ice storm. This was several years ago. Again, just a set of cows grazing through ice. Now, you got to have some forage. Is that, does that look like three or four inch tall forage? It's not, is it? If you're going to graze through ice or you're going to graze through six or eight inches of snow, those cows have got to know that there's something under there. You can't, you can't go graze three or four inches of grass underneath six or eight inches of snow. You, you've got you've to give them something to graze. Okay? Again, just a close up. I like red cows. Again, another set. That was about a four or five inch snow. Obviously, this was where they this is where they were, the strip they were in that day. This is where they were camped when it snowed. This is where they'd already grazed. This was where they're going, fresh strip across here. You know, when you can have some really tall grass, they'll, they'll be little holes in it and they can work their way down into it. Okay, they will learn, they'll learn to nose right into it and break up that crust. Um, this is a lady right here that I, that I worked with quite a bit. She's in her, I don't know, late 50s. Um, this is her, her father's place. She took it over when he passed away several years ago. She runs about 50 cows, 50 black cows. Um, she came to me a few years ago and said, man, I just, I'm, I'm not making any money. I've got to do something. So, so she was, they, they were... Her, her, when, her dad, when her dad was alive, there was one pasture that they, that they grazed year-round. Cows had been on that pasture for 30 or 40 years, had never been off of it. And everything else was hayed. So we came in, put a grazing system in. Um, she started, in addition to the, the high tensile and the water system, came in and started moving poly wire. Um, because she was going out there every day anyway. Started, started using poly wire a lot. And... And I was going to call her this morning to, to make sure exactly, and I forgot to. Um, in, that, in that 50 head of cows with, with heifers added in as well, this winter, I, I, I don't, and don't, don't quote me, but I, I'm pretty sure she's less than about 10 bales this winter. Um, because she's, she's moving that poly wire and stretching that grass. And they'll, they'll go through it again. you know. And this is, this is probably four or five inches of snow. And, and I realize, you know, when it gets to be two feet deep, that's fine. We got another picture for that here in a minute. But, but you can see that they're going to, once they're trained, once they understand, hey, we're going to go for it, they, they know there's something there. Okay? This is kind of crusted a little bit. You can see them busting up the crust here and going through it. Cows can go through a lot more snow than we ever would believe. Okay? If there's something there. The, the other thing is, is, is right now, okay? This is spring for us. This is March. And this was a fairly dry spring. I'll give you that. This was several years ago. So it so doesn't look like there's a lot of grass there, does there? 
it's, it's pretty matted down. Our, our wet snow, we can, we can really get it matted down. But there's a lot of grass there. This is, this is just a grazing stick stuck in and then pulled up. There was grass two feet tall in there. It was smashed down. Now I'll tell you, when it gets, when it gets smashed that flat, and yours is going to in this environment, you're going to have to have them on a, on a pretty tight you know, daily rotation to, to get very good utilization out of that. If they walk on it, in addition to it being smashed down, if they walk on it a little more, um, you, you're just not going to have anything left. Okay? But again, you know, you, you, you've got to have something out there. You've got to have a plan. It, am I going to have something for the spring? Our plan is we'll, we'll, graze, we'll graze all fall and all winter until I've got 45 days of stockpile left. At that point, I start feeding hay. And then I'll feed hay until the thaw hits. And when the thaw hits, then we go to the last, that last 45 or 50 days of stockpile. If I would have grazed that, so many people will graze all fall and into the winter until everything's gone. Well, then they got to feed hay in the spring in the mud. I, I don't want to do that. I want to I want to feed a little hay in the winter, and then as soon as the thaw hits, I want to go to grass. I want to get my cows out there. I don't want to fight that mud with with equipment. Um, last thing, annuals. You know, this was this is something that's really been coming along here pretty pretty hot and heavy the last few years. Um, this is, a, this is a friend down by Columbia, Luke Linenbringer. Um, he started grazing three or four years ago in a drought. He started grazing kind of on a whim. He started grazing corn in the middle of the summer just because it wasn't going to make any grain and he didn't have any grass left. So he started grazing this with cows. Now he's doing it on a continual basis. Since then, that these fields that are closest where he's got water, they haven't been harvested for grain in four years now after he saw the profitability. This spring surprise. So this was a field, he, he grazed half of it and his dad chopped half of it, okay? So it was a corn, a corn field, they grazed half, they chopped half and put it in the silo. And then the next spring, and it's a little hard to see, but you can kind of see the different color right here. See how this is darker? You got a strip where he laid out a little headland here with the chopper to put his fence in. This side was chopped. This side was grazed. Look at the difference in the color. That's because of the nutrients, that's because of the animal impact, the trampling of the residue. You can see a little bit. They drug some of it over here. Okay? So, so there's a lot more to it than just the nutrients that we're removing. These are some, some just a series here of pictures. Some annuals in the summer. Later on in the fall. Some oats got taller, got some snow in there, got a lot more snow. So if the snow gets deep, the forage has got to be, if you're talking this, you really want it above the snow, don't you? So, how, so if you get, if you got snow that's two feet deep, you got to have something that's pretty tall, right? This is even taller. So how about this? Now I realize there's no snow in here. This was, this is Harry Cope over by St. Louis. Um, this had radishes, he broadcast radishes in here. So, from a, from a nutrition standpoint, he's got his protein and his green radishes, he's got his energy and his corn, and, and how deep is the snow going to have to be before the cows can't get to this, this ear of corn? It's grain, he's feeding them grain, not going to argue that, but, but how deep can the snow be and still get to these ears of corn? Pretty deep, huh? Two or three feet. Is the, does the snow get deeper than two or three feet here? Once in a while? How many years, though, normally would it be deeper than that? So, so, so what about corn as, an, as a food source for these cows? Okay. There, there's actually some people, I, I, a lot of different places now that are doing this. Some, some people have been doing it for a long time. Harry's probably been doing it for... I don't know, 10 years? He's, he, this is actually a set of sheep. He's got some sheep in this, in this set. He also does Milo. Um, he prefers Milo because Milo not only has the grain, but it also has, the, has the, uh, the fodder that goes along with it. This is his sheep. He doesn't move the sheep quite as intensively because they don't tend to knock, knock the corn down. They're, they're not quite as aggressive nor as big. 
So they'll go down the rows instead of knocking the stocks down. They won't knock the stocks down until they need them. Unlike the cows, the cows will knock them down just walking around in them. So, so he can get away with a lot more lax, uh, a lot more lax rotation with the sheep. Um, you know, again, this, this spring period, you know, that's a time before your cool season perennials start taking off. This is, this is a, this is a fellow that's using some rye and some corn stalks, not only for his soil health benefits, but also for the livestock. Tremendous amount of forage there. He's moving them on, moving them on daily moves. Okay. Now he'll come in with, this will be soybeans. So here we are, this is, this is April. So he'll get, he'll get some regrowth on that before he comes in and plants so he has great ground cover again to no-till his soybeans into. Tremendous amount of, of animal days per acre right there. You know, so, so, so particularly in our prairie areas, um, we, we started out with, like I said, in my part of the world, 8% organic matter maybe. And, and, and there was a lot of really nice houses. There was a lot of really nice ranches and farms put together harvesting that, that equity out of the land. Harvesting that organic matter because that's what it was. You know, you, they, they talk about on the, on the radio or the TV, they talk about the stock market, right? Today was a profit-taking day. You've heard them say that. That meant people was, was selling stuff, taking that profit that they had built into it. Well, guess what? There was, a, there, was, there was a lot of profit in this country in soil organic matter when, when it was settled. And, and that's how a lot of those big houses, big ranches, big farms got put together, was by mining that land, wasn't it? Now, now we're all sitting here with 2% organic matter land and and we just think, well, that's, we, previously we had just thought, well, that's what it is. That's what it, you know, that's what it's got to be because we can't change it. You know, I'm here to tell you we can now. But what's it going to take? For those guys in the stock market to take those profits out, what did they have to do to begin with? They had to invest, didn't they? To invest in it to take the profits back out. Well, guess what? It's going to take a substantial amount of energy to to put that equity back in the land. It's gonna take, it's gonna take, oop, it's gonna take solar energy. We've gotta capture as much sunshine, store as much carbon in that soil as we can. We've got to use that animal energy because that animal energy is pretty cheap, isn't it? Would, would you rather use that petroleum energy, although it's getting cheaper, um, animal energy or petroleum? You know, and then the human side of it as well. You know, we, we, fight, we fight, some of the places we've taken over, we, fought, we fight some brush and stuff too. Um, you know, as, as, we, as we get them healed up, you know, we, we have to fight that brush less and less. But early on, you know, we, we, we fight some brush in some fields here and there. You know, my, my solution, my best solution, my, my, most, my most economic and my most... Uh, environmentally and my most socially acceptable for me method was to hire three or four boys and and give them give them loppers and chainsaws and, and a bottle of Tordon. I can cover I can cover land with the same cost per acre giving them a job and letting them do it as taking a taking a tractor and bush hog and bush hog in a place if, if I'm trying to take out locust trees or cedar trees or something like that okay how many more dollars are going to be spent in my local community by me doing that, by me giving them a job, versus if I go buy a tractor, and I got one, but if I put more hours on it, and a bush hog and diesel, all of those equipment dollar costs go, go to the city someplace. They, they, go, they go to some other country, they go to some corporation. I want my dollars to stay in my community. And so that's, that's my investment um, of energy, you know, and I'm also looking long term, you know, if, if I'm going to invest this organic matter in my place and, and, and do the management, you know, maybe I'll, I'll reap some of those rewards, maybe my family will at some point. Um, I got to still be profitable today, I understand that, but we also have to invest. Questions? Sir. 
Uh, this sounds a lot, a lot like the system that the Arctic Kings have been using for a long time, raising bait. Uh, one of the things that I keep rolling around on my mind is we talk about no disturbance in soil and how to work that into the system and annuals. You know, we talk about annuals. Yep. Yeah, my perennials go way south of July. Yep. So I need those annuals to uh, help my summer swamp. But I have to physically disturb if I can't use pesticides, herbicides, that kind of thing. Well, I, I, you know, that's a great question, you know, as far as, I, I, I don't think there's very many things we can't do um, with, with, with disturbance from livestock or manipulation with livestock. Um, you know, the, the, and we were talking about this at lunch, you know, trying to, trying to get uh, more, more warm season grasses into our existing pastures, okay? Um, and, and we're starting to do that with annuals. So, so what we've been trying to do is, is use a, a highly mycorrhizal mix of annuals to, to stimulate that soil biology before I go into my, my native mixes, my, my warm season and cool season mixes. Um, I, think, I think there's very few situations where we have to do tillage as far as, as, far as you know, I, I just, you know, I, the, tillage is just a... Which, which brings me around to another thing. I've seen some of the, you know, some of the traditional warm season graphics. Uh, I saw some research on KBS, that kind of stuff. A lot of this stuff looks like brush. The warm season grasses? Well, there's, there's no doubt that it's, there, there's no doubt that it is, um, here, I'll give you that one. The, 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 they're, they're a lot higher carbon plant, for sure. But, but what's our problem? What are we trying to do um, with the soil? It might, that's not even working. So I'm just going to go this way. What are we trying to do? We're trying to add organic matter, which is 58% carbon. So I want high carbon plants. And that's the warm season plants to me in my environment. Um, you know, yours natives would have been, would have been, uh, would have been trees. Well, you're not going to graze trees, but, but still, again, like I said this morning, if you're going to want prairie plants, um, you know, want that? Yeah. You're going to want, he said, no, he's still videoing me. So, so you're going to want high carbon plants. You're going you're gonna to need those. Now, I realize you're far enough north that, that it's not going to be as big a component as mine. But, you know, I was, in, I was telling them at lunch, and I was, in, I was up in Manitoba um, two or three years ago, and I did the same talk up there and said, well, you know, we need some warm seasons. To, because they just, they're more water efficient. Um, they produce more biomass in the soil. You know, cool season grasses have got one pound of leaf and one pound of root, essentially. It's a one-to-one. -one. Warm seasons have one pound of leaves and two or three pounds of roots. What's gonna, that, that's going to store more carbon. It's going to give us more biology. It's going to do so many things for the soil. But I was up in, I was up in Manitoba, and they I did this talk, and they said, oh, we don't have, we're too far north. We can't, we can't have any warm season grasses. So I said, well, okay, maybe. So we go out on the, on the field tour in the afternoon, and we pulled up to a guy who had been doing, using a kind of a, a boom and bust, really long rest periods and a lot of trampling. And we pull, up, we pull up to the gate, and I kind of started laughing. And I was like, well, well what are these plants right here? And, and they all said, well, we don't know, some kind of weed. It was big blue stem. Okay? So, so you know, I realize you guys are a forest environment, and, and that's going to, that's gonna, I don't know. I, I'm just saying. But I know from a soil standpoint, from a carbon standpoint, from a root standpoint, the warm seasons are so much better than the cool seasons. We need a cool season component. We need a cool and a warm mix. But a little bit of warm season in that mix, I, I just can't help believe that even in your environment, that's not going to bring about some substantial benefits. Last one. Can you just drill in warm season grasses and Can you just drill them in? Boy, that's a really good question. You're going to have to suppress those cool seasons in some way. <clears throat> graze them. We've tried a lot of different things. We're dealing with fescue, which is a little bit different than what you guys are dealing with, but, but some of the methods are, are, are graze it and don't give it an adequate recovery. Graze it, <clears throat> come back five or six days later, graze it again, five or six days later, graze it again.
just just hammer it and then come in. Um, fescue, boy, fescue is really tough. We just about have to use some type of chemical suppression to get our to get our uh, worm seasons to go in the fescue. Any other questions? We have one more, maybe burning question, and then we do have to to move on. I guess I want to address the uh, pollution side of your program. I am not supposed to spread manure on frozen ground, and you're doing it year round. What's the difference? Just because the law says yours is okay and mine's not? I, I you know, are, are you applying more than what I am? If I'm not, if I'm not, if I'm only grazing what's there, now the, 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 you know, bringing hay in, you know, if I bring in a lot and put on an area, but I, I don't know what rate you're applying, I guess. No. But they don't want, they don't want manure spread on frozen ground I, here. I, here. No, th there's a whole lot of things. Can I turn this off? We're not working for the government today. There's a whole lot of things the government does that, that, that I don't, you know, I don't, I, I don't understand why or don't believe in, you know, we, I mean, it, and, and I say this about our land, it's kind of like, you know, how many of you think that, that, and this is probably a, for the most part, a conservative group, you reckon? I would hope so. You would hope so. <laughs> so, 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 and I work for the government, okay, I, I, so, and I still don't understand them. You know, how many of them think that, that we're, you know, we're borrowing, our government is borrowing from our kids' inheritance, right? I see a lot of heads shaking yes. Well, guess what? <clears throat> Most of our farming methods that we're using today, you're stealing your kid's inheritance out of your soil. You really are. You really are. You know, if, if, you're not, if your organic matter is not building up, if it's, if it's holding its own, if you're losing any soil, guess what? You're, you're taking from your kids. Sir? Guys, this has got to be the last question. I promised Jerry before he left the room that I would keep uh, this room on track. And I see 15 minutes off. This is just a comment. I've got meat certification on my grazing operation, and they apply it year-round. Uh, and it's, it's a question of concentration and runoff. Yeah. Yep. One I, thing's for certain, when you have Doug uh, speak at an event, you know he's going to get things stirred up. We knew that as a committee uh, when we asked him to come here. If you, you got to take something away from today, we've been talking on and off with the different folks in the conference uh, about the take-home message. And, and will you use everything that Doug talked about today? Probably not. But if you don't start somewhere, you'll never get to the, to the end goal. And I, I would just like to uh, give Doug a round of applause and thank you for coming. Again.